Bonjour, and a very spooky welcome to another episode of Métis Time Capsule. You're, of course, with your host, Alexandria Anthony. And let's face it, listeners, I know it's been a minute since the last episode, but I can promise you all there's much, much more to come. Wanting to wish everybody out there a very happy Halloween. Keep it spooky, but keep it safe. And me, uh, El Halloween in Machif. And uh, again, I want to also give a trigger warning for this particular spooky episode. It may not be for the faint of heart. There's a lot of gruesome details. But if you're into that kind of stuff, buckle up your Métis sash. We're in for a heck of a ride. But before we kind of jig right into today's spooky edition, um, Let's talk Wendigo, and I guess you're going to guess by now that the episode's about Wendigo. And the Wendigo legend existed in Algonquin oral history for many, many centuries, long before those Europeans decided to jump in their boats and arrive in North America. However, the first European uh, written account of how Wendigo was by Paul Lejeune, who was a Jesuit missionary who lived among the Algonquin people in the early 17th century in what is now Quebec in Canada. And in a report to his superiors in Paris, France in 1636, uh, listen to what Lejeune wrote, and I quote, this devilish woman added that Windigo had eaten some of the native tribes that lived north of the river that is called Three Rivers, and that he would eat a great many more of them if he were not called elsewhere. But that Chitin, which is a sort of a werewolf, would come in his place to devour them, even up to the French fort, that he would slaughter the French himself, end of quote. So that's kind of a chilling account uh, going way back to 1636 from no, you know, no less than a Jesuit missionary sending it to his superiors in Paris, France. And stories uh, could also be found uh, on the western frontier in the 1800s among Plains Indigenous people and employees of the Hudson Bay Company. And some Hudson Bay traders, uh, their records describe encounters with Indigenous spiritual leaders claiming to really descend into fits of religious uh, passion. And Indigenous peoples often accuse these people of being Wendigos and uh, Hudson Bay Company traders sometimes described these uh, individuals as mad, crazy lunatics. And a lot of these legends, uh, in a lot of these legends, the humans that are transformed into these Wendigos are because of greed or weakness. So character flaws, of course, being greedy and uh, just sort of being uh, weak. So without further ado, let's get into today's uh, spooky edition of the cannibal spirit. And um, it's known in Michif as uh, Kamuchat. And again, that is the cannibal spirit. And they also represent the ever present danger of starvation. And that's a key word in this particular episode of starvation uh, in hunting and gathering cultures. And um, there can also be human uh, Wendigos, uh, Wendigos, people who do very bad things and uh, are said to be possessed by a very evil 
and malevolent spirit. And uh, Wittigo is also known as Wendigos. Uh, Wittigos or Wendigos are said to be these giant, uh, again, cannibalistic monsters uh, with skeleton bodies and monstrous uh, white uh, heads. And it's interesting also to note that many accounts of uh, these cannibal monsters or cannibal entities were mentioned in French Canadian uh, voyageur uh, oral traditions. And uh, German explorer uh, Johann George Kohl, uh, while he was, it said that while he was traveling around Lake Superior in the 1850s, had met many elderly French Canadian voyageurs and uh, their Aboriginal wives. And so many stories were told again, uh, this key word, starvation. And uh, a lot of researchers, historians also call them the starving time, uh, which often led to these stories again of these cannibals and cannibalistic entities. And Cannibalism was indeed sort of part and parcel, went hand in hand, uh, in you know, of life in the Pédinal, which is called in upper country. And fur trader Alexander Henry the Elder really could attest to this himself, and we'll go into that more in a few minutes. And Ottawa and Ojibwa warriors would often slaughter and eat prisoners they captured in battle. And they truly, truly believed that by doing so, they might absorb uh, the enemy's courage. So they thought by eating their prisoners of war, they would absorb the enemy's courage. And the natives, this is a very important distinction. The natives made a great distinction between uh, consuming an enemy warrior after the battle and the consumption of human flesh as a means of survival in the cold winter months or as we come to know them as the starving times. Other than the consumption of an enemy warrior, the consumption of human flesh as a means of survival was regarded with great fear and revulsion and um, they associated it with a sort of the evil spirit that they called the Wendigo. And Algonquin legend says that the Wendigo roamed the wilderness in the harsh winter in search of human hosts and the men and women that were possessed by the Wendigo would develop an insatiable craving for human flesh and would drive them to literally butcher and eat their family and friends even when there was other food sources available. And during the days of the North American fur trade, uh, suspected cases of Wendigo uh, possession occurred frequently in the Canadian wilderness. And sometimes these alleged cases ended with, again, trigger warning, the very gruesome edu you know, execution of the suspected Wendigo. And um, oddly enough, a lot of times at the request of the individual that was inflicted, that was afflicted. And sometimes alleged cases of Wendigo uh, possession resulted in these very bizarre cannibalistic killing sprees, almost like serial killer cannabis, cannibalistic uh, killing sprees that really was couldn't be explained. It was beyond anybody's scope of rationalization thinking. And we now come into Alexander Henry the Elder, who of course was a fur trade amongst other things, was a witness to this very bizarre, bizarre phenomena. And um, first, he came into witnesses firsthand in the winter of 1766, and he was camped on the south shores 
of Lake Superior with his French Canadian employees. And while there, they were joined by a band of Indians who were fleeing their homes from extreme famine. And after the band had been with them for, I guess, about two days, a very unkept and a real filthy looking adolescent smelling most foul, he just stunk, wandered out of the deep woods. The adolescent told Henry and the others that his family had been starving and that only he had could muster enough strength to leave their camp to search for food. And I quote, his arrival struck our camp with horror and une uneasiness, end of quote, Henry wrote. And I go on to quote, and it was not long before the Indians came to me saying that they, ex they suspected he had been eating human flesh and even that he had killed and devoured the family which he pretended to have left behind." End of quote. Although the adolescent, of course, denied uh, the charges when questioned, the Indians who encamped nearby decided to investigate for themselves and followed his trail back to his family's camp. And I quote, the next day, Henry wrote, they returned bringing with them a human hand and a human skull. The hand had been left roasting before a fire. The intestines taken out of the body from which it was cut hung fresh on a neighboring tree." End of quote. When the adolescent was presented with this hardcore evidence, he finally he confessed to, that he did indeed consume his family, his uncle and aunt, and four of their children. Uh, he went on to express that after a hunting expedition that just miserably failed, his uncle had fallen into a very deep, dark depression. And uh, of all, you know, of all things, he asked his wife to kill him. His wife failed to comply with her husband's demands but the adolescents, the adolescent and his older cousin decided to carry out this grim, bruisely deed of killing him. The boys murdered their respective father and uncle and ate his body. Soon after, they did the same thing to the two youngest children. And as the dead man's widow was just too sick, old and feeble to travel, they left her behind and headed into the bush towards Lake Superior. Along the way, the adolescent killed his elder cousin and ate him. So the body parts that the Indians found uh, by the fire were his cousin's last remains. And I quote, the Indians entertain an option, Henry wrote. And I go on further, I quote, that the man who has once made human flesh his food will never afterward be satisfi satisfied with any other. It is probable that we saw things in some measure through the medium of our prejudice, but I confess that this distressing object appeared to verify the doctrine. He ate with relish, nothing that was given him, but indifference to the food prepared, fixed his eyes continuously on the children which were in the Indian lodge and frequently exclaimed, how fat they are, end of quote. Fearful that he would attempt to eat, butcher, cannibalize their children, the Indians executed the adolescent by splitting his head with an ax when his attention was distracted. So there are many other, and I invite you to explore cannibalistic tales in many fur trader journals. 
in regards to the starving times. And you can really imagine, too, that when the European, the fur traders came into the scene, that a lot, lot of the indigenous First Nation people, uh, you know, trapping was depleting all various uh, uh, animals that were there so people would starve, etc. So very horrific account, very graphic account, just one of many folks. And before we end this episode, there is also a, a, a Métis superstition of black dogs. And I know that uh, black dogs in various cultures symbolize, you know, the meaning or the apparition or the foretelling of death. And the Métis people have a lot of superstitions, a lot of stories, a lot of different stories that are in folklore. But this is personal to me because this this involves uh, my grandfather and one of his brothers. So this is a true true story uh, I'm telling you. And uh, it was said that uh, one of my grandfather's brothers liked to drink carouse, and we, they didn't call it back in the day party, but it was really carouse and drink and do all these things and you know just have a general good time and his mother would always tell him he'd do it on a Sunday and you know I'm not bringing religion into this uh, 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 episode but it happened to be a Sunday where he would take the horse and the wagon and just go out and carouse and drink and all that his mother had warned him about drinking specifically on a Sunday so against what his mother uh, asked him to do, my uh, grandfather's uh, brother went out to go do that. So the odd thing is, when he was coming back from his carousing, his mother was looking out the window and she was spellbound. She was just shocked. Um, he was coming back, of course, in his, uh, you know, horse in his buggy or carriage, whatever he had at the time. And there was a black dog chasing him. Uh, and um, the dog's feet weren't touching the ground. And it was a huge, it wasn't a wolf, it was just a black dog. So he was coming home. And um, she did know too, again, that the black dog was chasing him back home. And his feet were not on the ground, but his eyes were blood, blood red and she was all she could do is stand you know horrified at the window at her son coming home with this huge ominous eerie evil black dog chasing him he made it back into the yard and uh, the dog disappeared and uh, when he came into the home he said to his mother before his mother even said anything he said you know he said I had a feeling of just pure evil blackness that somebody was following me but he said I was too scared to look back I just whipped the horses to go faster and faster and uh, his mother went to go on to say that there was this huge black dog with blood red eyes following him and the feet the, the dog's feet weren't even touching the ground so you know a lesson learned you know after his mother told him about the black dog. He never, ever went out carousing, drinking on a Sunday again. And I know a lot of us may have different versions, uh, variations of this black dog story. But again, it's supposed to be uh, ominous or a warning of a, a foretelling of a possible death. So again, folks, thank you for listening. Uh, to this very spooky edition of Métis Time Capsule. Want to wish every, every one of you a very spooky Halloween and keep it safe. And until next time, folks.